So Narayana Murthy wants young people in India to want to work 70 hours a week, to do so voluntarily. And his wife, Asuta Murthy, backed him up by saying he has worked 80 to 90 hours a week, so he doesn't know what less than that is. He believes in real hard work, and he lived like that. Then Bhavish Agarwal chimed in and said, not just 70, more like 140, no weekends. He also tweeted, our generation is destined to build India to the largest economy. It will take every effort, but there's no better satisfaction than to control tribute in this journey. So Pankaj, how do you feel as an Indian about all of these statements? So before I discuss what I feel, I think it's very important to set the context right because when Narayan Murthy is saying that we have to work 70 hours a week, he's not asking you to just get fixated on that number, right? We're talking about the entire culture that Indians have to build as a nation as a whole. So the debate that we need to be having is much bigger than that, you know, that number of 70 hours because I see people just taking it too personally that I'm working 40 hours, I don't want to be working 70 hours, how it's going to mess up with my weekends and stuff. And I think if you watch that entire podcast of, you know, Mohan Das Pai with the Narayan Murthy, I think his focus is how we as youngsters, how we can make India as one of the leading superpowers with US and China and, you know, rest of the countries. And how work ethic, how our lower productivity is sort of stopping us, you know, to reach there. So let's actually hear what he has to say. So therefore, my request is that our youngsters must say, this is my country. I want to work 70 hours a week. And this is not the only time that he talks about something like this, right? Here's another clip. So therefore, my request to all the wonderful youth of this country is that realize this and work 12 hour days for the next 20 years, 50 years, whatever it is, so that India too becomes a number one nation or number two nation, whatever it is, in terms of its GDP. Okay, yeah, so watching that clip and especially looking at the last line, I think that's the most important. So that too, India becomes a number one or number two nation in terms of its GDP. I think that's brings us kind of the, to the crux of this debate, the whole point of why we're having this conversation, which is, is that actually what's gonna happen if young people in India work 70 plus hours a week uh, and young people described by Mohandas Pai as people usually below the ages of 30, if they actually step up and work um, way longer than they normally do, which is typically 40 to 50 hours per week, is that gonna lead India in the direction of having a number one or number two GDP? And looking at the countries listed by GDP right now, obviously number one is the United States, number two is China. India currently is at number five. And so in order to get to number one, India would need to, of course, overtake the United States and China, but also Japan and Germany. And so for the purposes of this debate, I'm gonna be arguing from the perspective of someone who's saying no, that 70 hour work week for young people is not going to lead India to the position of a nation with a GDP in the number two or number one spot. And I'll be arguing for the fact that we do need that 70 hour work week culture in order for India to, you know, make number one or number two in terms of superpower. And I think before we start this, let's just put this out there that this is not our personal opinions. So before you guys get angry and say that, you know, Caleb wants to hold India back or Pankaj is just supporting this employees becoming slaves. I think it's really important that this is just a healthy debate. We are just seeing what's happening, what discussions people are having and trying to put a healthy, you know, back and forth of both sides. Not necessarily our personal opinions. Exactly. So with that aside, let's start the debate and let's talk about health because that's the biggest thing I think people are talking about that how it's very detrimental to their health. Yeah, so I wanted to start this conversation around health because I noticed that a lot of people on Twitter were talking about that specific angle of this issue, um, which is that if you're working 70 hours a week, typically that's not gonna have a positive impact on your health. Overworking generally um, doesn't make you a healthier person. And I actually had a friend who had this framework, this rule that he lived his life by, H triple W, okay? So health, wealth, women, and weather. So he wanted to be healthy, he wanted to be around women, whether that's the Tony Stark approach to women or whether that's having a girlfriend or a wife. He wanted to be wealthy, to have money, and he wanted to be in a country or a city with good weather. But I think there's a reason why it starts with H, right, where the first letter out of those four is health, and that's because without health, you can't enjoy the other three, whereas without women, you can still enjoy wealth and weather. Without weather, you can still enjoy 
wealth in women, right? But without health, you can enjoy women, you can enjoy wealth, and you can enjoy good weather. And so to explore this topic of health, I want to take a look at a study conducted by the WHO and the ILO, the International Labor Organization. And basically what this study sort of concludes with is that working long hours leads to heart disease and stroke, and these can kill people, which removes them from the economy and also leads to many years of low productivity if it doesn't kill you. And this is measured in something called DALI, which is disability adjusted life years. And so by the definition set forward by this study, working more than 55 hours a week, not 70 hours, just 55 hours is considered long working hours. And globally, 488 million people work these hours in 2016. So out of these 488 million people, 7.45 lakh people died directly because of ischemic heart disease and stroke, and 23.3 million people experienced disability-adjusted life years, meaning, again, years lost due to this disability where people were not productive because of ischemic heart disease and stroke. Also, the study calls out two specific regions in the world, the Western Pacific and Southeast Asia. And as we all know, China is the most populous country in the Western Pacific, and India is the most populous country in Southeast Asia. So I thought that was really interesting. And then also the fact that men are more likely to experience and be susceptible to these diseases than women, right? And statistically, women are more likely to be homemakers, not to say that being a homemaker is not hard work, but men are more statistically likely to be working long hours in the office, 50, 60, 70 hours sometimes, especially in the, these parts of the world, right? So, um, and, and we all know this, right? Intuitively, I think we all have heard of or understand the concept of men dying young from having a heart attack, um, and then later in their life, sometimes even a stroke, if they're working too hard, they're stressed out all the time. Um, this also leads to unhealthy lifestyle habits, right? If you're working long hours, then you might not be eating right, you, you might not be exercising properly. And so because of all of these factors combined, you end up having poor health. And so to wrap all this up and summarize, the young people of a country working 70 hours a week is going to lead to more health problems and more deaths in that country. And this is just a fact, right? If people worked 40 hours a week, there would be less health problems and less deaths than if people are working 70 hours a week. This is just statistics, right? This is just basic math. And this might be good for the pharmaceutical industry, for the hospital industry, for ambulances. Like there's an industry just built up around people having health problems, right? Uh, the funeral industry as well. Uh, cremations are going to go up, right? There's there's money to be made here, certainly, um, which will, you know, have a positive impact on the economy. But I think generally speaking, having people in your economy who are disabled or who are dying is not good because those are people who are not productive, right? They're not contributing because either they're dead or they're disabled uh, later on in their life and they just can't contribute. So I don't think that's going to be good for India's GDP in the long run overall. So I don't disagree with the health problems that you mentioned. I know we are used to living in a certain way. And if you make too many changes to that, it might be detrimental to our health. But I think that's the biggest mistake people are making. People are saying that if I have to put 70 hours a week, I have to work like 14 hours every day, right? Considering that you're working five days and they count it like 14 hours I have to work, eight hours I have to sleep. That leaves me with two hours to do everything, commuting, eating, everything, you know, uh, other stuff. But that's not the point. The point is how do we increase our productivity? And I think that's the biggest point Narayan Murthy was trying to make. India ranks 64 in terms of labor productivity out of 69 countries. And Pakistan actually has better productivity than India. So this should be the focus. And I don't think working long hours is killing people. Stress is the biggest cause of heart-related disease. And what's surprising is people today are more stressed than they were 30 years ago. So what I'm trying to say is that people are getting more stressed but at the same time, working hours are going down. So there's no direct relation between that, that if you work harder, your stress level gonna go up and you'll get more heart disease, right? And my final argument is, when you take a look at people like Narayan Murthy or Nandan Elekani, how did those people build institutions like Infosys? I don't think they were looking at working hours. I have to go at 7 p.m. I have to go home. I have to maintain this work-life balance. I think there was something that's driving them that's much bigger than their personal ambitions. And I think we all have to find that, right? If working for someone doesn't give you that kick, then start your own venture, right? Work for yourself. And I think that's the biggest contribution you can make to the development of this country. Okay, well, uh, very interesting topics there. Um, and I think the audience will let us know who won that part of the debate. Let's move on to the next topic though, which is consumerism. And I think this one is really interesting because 
People, in my opinion, who are overworked, they just don't have time to consume. If you think about it, right, if you are exhausted, you're burnt out, you're just spending all of your time working, are you thinking about, you know, your next visit to the mall? Are you thinking about going on to Amazon to order something fun to enjoy in your free time? No, because you don't have free time. You don't have that energy. You don't have that happiness, right? You need to be happy. You need to have free time and you need to have disposable income in order to enjoy life and actually go out and buy stuff. And I think that last requirement, having disposable income, that probably will be satisfied if people are working 70 plus hours a week, but the other two won't. How do I know this? Well, apart from personal experience, right? You don't wanna spend money if you're feeling burnt out and exhausted all the time, but this is actually played out in the past. So in the early 20th century in the United States, the 40 hour work week wasn't really a thing. This was the industrial revolution, right? It was kind of like China over the last 20 years. Everything was hyper, hyper competitive. And so 10 to 16 hour days were pretty much the norm. People were often working 80 to 100 hours every single week. And also people really didn't take days off. Some people might take Sunday off, but even that wasn't really a given. And here's the other thing about this time period too. Child labor was a big thing. Here's an ad from 1900. Farm machines so easy to handle that your boy can operate them successfully in the field. And so I wanna give you an example of a company that turned things around back then, Ford Motor Company. So they were actually struggling in the early 20th century, even though they were growing very quickly and innovating technologically, but because they were paying their employees too little and expecting them to work too hard, they were facing this issue of employee attrition, which meant that they needed to spend more money on hiring and training new employees. And so Henry Ford gets this crazy idea. This was unheard of at the time. What if we paid people more money? And so in 1914, he more than doubled his employees' daily pay from $2.34 for nine hours of work to $5 for eight hours of work. And the thing is, this really worked. Employees were happier. They stopped quitting because Ford was literally giving them the best salaries of any automotive company in the business. Attrition dropped off a cliff. Productivity went way up because it was eight hours instead of nine hours. People were sleeping more. They were spending an extra hour with their families. And then in the 1920s, they doubled down on this policy change where they actually asked people to come into work five days a week instead of six days a week. Now, at this point, you're probably wondering, what does this have to do with GDP, right? We're talking about one company here. We're not talking about an entire country, but that's where you're wrong because Ford had a massive impact. Other companies were looking at Ford to see what they were doing, how they were actually winning in this industry with so much competition. And so what they saw is that employees were actually able to buy Ford cars with four months pay. And so Ford's costs were going down, their sales were going up, and the strategy was really working for them. And so other companies, both in the United States and also outside of the United States, started following Ford's lead. And so this is why now in the United States and in many other parts of the world, the five day work week and the nine to five daily work schedule are the norm. And so just to summarize my points here, I think that people are more productive and they spend more money. They have more consumeristic habits when one, they get paid more money and two, when they get more time off. So they actually have some time to shop, to think about the things that they would wanna buy to enjoy the free time that they have in their life. And so yes, you might think that people working 70 plus hours a week would actually contribute more to the economy. But in reality, you actually need people to be spending money to be happy and going out and shopping and buying stuff in order for your GDP to increase. And in order to make that happen, people do need to have some uh, time to just kick back, relax, and actually spend money. So I agree with that, that people do need time to sit back, relax, and rejuvenate before they can come to work another day. But I think that's not my point or for the people who are pushing for this argument. Their main concern is what kind of culture are we building for Indians, right? So if you take a look at what makes a country rich, right? I think this, if I simplify it, one, if you're a poor country, you build a set of services and products and then you sell it to the richer countries, right? And then that money comes back that gets reinvested, that like more people get job and more money gets formed, right? That's how a country gets rich, like it's economy one on one. And I can give you clear examples to prove that. So if you take a look at early 20th century, Europe was very rich, right? And there were two world wars. So America produced a lot of weapons and other things that you need, uh, jeeps and tanks and stuff like that. And they sold it to European countries. That made America rich. And if you take a second half, if you take a look at the second half of 20th century, 
China thought that we could be the manufacturing hub of the world, right? We have this young population, we can train them very easily. And that made China a manufacturing hub, right? And then China did the same with uh, internet economy in back in 90s. And if you want to understand what kind of culture was there in China in those early days, I want you to take a look at this clip from 1999. And this is Jack Ma explaining what kind of philosophy he, you know, expects from people for Alibaba in future days. So here he talks about the fact that if you have that attitude that I have to go home at 7 p.m., I need my work-life balance, Chinese could never compete with Americans, right? And I think that's why China came up with pol this policy of 996. It's basically 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. You work six days a week. So that gives you like around 72 hours. And you can argue that it's, very, it's not unfair to the labors, but I think that's what contributed to China growing at 10% or more for more than 25 years. And since that policy sort of people are rejecting that, since then China's economy is sort of collapsing. In fact, Jack Ma himself agrees with me. According to him, without this 996 system, China's economy was very likely to lose vitality and impetus. And then this is the founder of JD.com, one of the biggest e-commerce companies. He has to say that years of rapid economic growth in China had boosted the number of slackers. If this carries on, JD will have no hope and the company will only be heartlessly kicked out of the market. Slackers are not my brothers. So my point after all of this is China developed because of this hard work culture, especially this 996 thing, and it helped them immensely. I mean, I get what you're saying, but like, here's the thing. 996 actually goes against Chinese labor laws. According to these laws, Chinese companies must practice a working hour system wherein laborers shall work no more than eight hours a day and no more than 44 hours a week on average, and they should get one day off a week minimum. And there's a bunch of other stuff too here if you wanna pause the video and take a look at some of China's pro-employee policies. Oftentimes these aren't enforced, which has caused a lot of problems for China in the past, but I also think it's worth looking at what happens when companies or even individual founders don't follow these rules. So you mentioned Jack Ma, in the past, and so I wanna talk about one of the things that he said in 2019, which was, I personally think that being able to work 996 is a huge blessing. How do you achieve the success you want without paying extra effort and time? Now, the issue with this kind of rhetoric, obviously, is that it's gonna be interpreted by the government of China as Jack Ma basically saying, I disagree with Chinese labor laws and I wanna do my own thing. And so, obviously, China did not take kindly to this and they reacted. In late 2020, the government of China actually blocked Ant's IPO and Jack Ma essentially disappeared from the public spotlight and he hasn't really been back since. I mean, he's been spotted, he's obviously alive, he's doing stuff, but he definitely isn't the public persona that he used to be. But in spite of this disciplinary action, I think the consequences of this 996 work culture have already started to take effect in Chinese society, where in 2021, two employees at e-commerce platform Pinduoduo actually died weeks apart. A young worker collapsed on his way home from work after working very long hours, and then another employee actually ended their own life. Also in 2021, a food delivery driver set himself on fire in an act of frustration and protest after he was allegedly denied the Chinese equivalent of 770 US dollars in overdue wages. And then lastly, a worker died while delivering meals for online platform Eleme in late 2020, and he had collapsed on the job, possibly due to overworking, and the company said that they could only compensate his family 309 US dollars, which really upset people. So I don't know if you've heard of this term, Tang Pyeon, which was one of the top 10 buzzwords in China in 2021. It means lying flat, but basically, it's a rejection of overworking where you just let things be and do the bare minimum required when it comes to work. So that was in 2021, like I said, but things got worse in 2022 with the term bailan, which basically means let it rot. A new phenomenon called bailan, meaning let it rot. I understand bailan. If I give you a 
能不能明天再做，或者是。And so I think zooming out here for a second, this is the perfect example of what happens when a country expects or at least encourages its young people to overwork. Right? They eventually reject that idea. Maybe it takes a decade, maybe it takes two decades, but eventually the young people are not going to be interested in doing that any longer. Especially when the economy does improve and they start going to school, they start getting their bachelor's, their master's. And they're overeducated for a lot of the blue collar and white collar jobs in that country, and they want a higher standard of living, right? And so a lot of them are leaving China, and the ones that are staying in China, they're saying, "I don't want to go to work." And not only that, but I'd rather be a full time daughter or a full time son. This is another buzzword, right? People are actually labeling labeling themselves full time daughter or full time son instead of. Full-time employee, which of course is a very worrying trend for the government of China. They're trying to censor these kinds of buzzwords so that people don't. This concept doesn't start spreading around and becoming even more popular than it already is. But I think the damage is already done because inside of people's own own minds, they're no longer enamored with this idea of working super hard to further the GDP, to further the the country, the People's Republic of China. People don't want to do that anymore. They want to be selfish. They want to just. Do things for themselves, not for the country, and not for an employer. And it's gotten so bad now that China has actually suspended their national multi-year report on youth unemployment because one fifth of all Chinese youth between the ages of 16 and 24 were literally unemployed. And so China didn't want the rest of the world to see that, and so they stopped publishing this report. I think it's really interesting to look at what Xi Jinping has said in response to these trends, to these young people who are not interested in working. It's very tone deaf. He clearly doesn't get it. He thinks that things are just going to go back to the way that they were. And so, what he said is that young people should go out and look for trouble. He said that he thinks young people should ask for hardship. And just thinking about living a comfortable life is a mediocre pursuit. And I am prepared to enter the sea of misery. And he's trying to lead by example here, right? He's saying that I am prepared to enter the sea of misery. He's talking about his childhood, his youth, right,、uh, his teenage years, where he was ready to work very hard. And because of that hard work, he was able to translate that into results, not just for himself and his own personal life, but also for his country, China. Right, and so he's trying to say to the young people, "Hey, do the same thing as me. Right, go into the rural parts of the country, work your fingers to the bone, suffer, experience hardship, and you will see results, and the country will also see results." But I don't think the young people are really buying it. And also, what he's saying here is very, very reminiscent. Of Narendra Murthy talking about working 70 hours a week so that India can become a number one or number two nation when it comes to GDP. It sounds very similar, at least to me. And so my takeaway here, my closing thoughts are that a lot of countries and a lot of entrepreneurs look up to Chinese work culture, this 996 work culture, and say that we should emulate that, we should copy that. If we want to get ahead, if we want to be in China's position as the number two GDP in the world, we need to do what China did, or we need to do what the United States did back in the day in the Industrial Revolution, where people worked 80 to 100 hours a week. And the thing is, in my opinion, this is not sustainable, and China is not actually a successful case study. I think maybe in the short term, right now in 2023, it might look that way, but really, this 996 work culture thing, this is a sprint. This is not a marathon, right? And sprinting is not sustainable. You can't sprint indefinitely. China didn't crack down on 996 work culture until it was too late. They forced policies onto their population, like the zero COVID policy and the one child policy. And also, there's been recent crackdowns in education, IT, and real estate. And so, China has basically failed to incentivize its youth. It's focused way too much on the stick and way too little on the carrot. And young people are just tired of living that way. They're tired of being under this pressure and these expectations. And so, if I had to offer a prescription to India, and by the way, I think India is in an incredible spot because it can actually look at China, the number two GDP, as the number five GDP, and look at all the things that China has done right, but also all the things that China has done wrong. And so, if I was India, I would say, okay, China is focused more on the stick. Right, it's kind of asked people to work overtime, overworking, nine nine six. Right, not officially. The government of China hasn't encouraged this kind of behavior officially, but it's allowed that culture to propagate. Right, that it's become kind of ubiquitous. It's kind of become something that China is known for. People overworking and working to the point where they 
end their own lives or they get sick and you know they collapse on the job. I think it's more a situation where young people, both in China and also in India, feel like they're not getting adequately rewarded for their hard work. So if I work 40 hours a week, if I do my nine to five or nine to six or whatever the shift might be, I'm gonna get paid this amount of money, but then if I work overtime, if I work 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week, the incentives there are not sufficient for me to feel like that was a worthwhile use of my time, right? Maybe over time you only get paid, you know, an extra few hundred rupees uh, on top of your sort of hourly wage. Like, you know, you get diminishing returns, right? It's like, I'm, I'm now I'm feeling unhealthy, I'm not getting enough sleep, I'm not eating well because I'm spending these extra hours in the office, I don't get to spend time with my family. And so I'm not getting paid double or triple, which is what I should be getting paid if I'm working so hard. Instead, I'm just getting this little token amount. As long as India can focus more on the carrot and less on the stick, then I think you can actually achieve this 70 hour work week um, without sort of forcing people or just asking them to do it uh, out of the goodness of their own heart, altruistically, right? I think you can actually achieve this and increase the country's GDP, but you have to, you know, incentivize people. And I think that's gonna be a huge challenge for India. But if India can do that, then uh, I think that the country will move in the right direction. So in the end, I just wanna bring back the context of this entire debate that I've been talking about since the beginning. It's not about you putting in 70 hour weeks. It's not about today you're working eight hours and today suddenly you have to wake up and work 14 hours weeks. The point is that we have to have a vision for India for next many decades, right? We have to have a vision that where do we see India in 2047? What does our vision of India 2047 looks like? And I think that vision has already been laid out by PM Modi when he says that India has to become a developed country by 2047. That means we have to have an economy of 30 to 35 trillion dollars. And India needs to grow at 8 to 9% consistently for 20 to 25 years to get there. And that requires us to think big. I mean, all we have to do is take a look at what other countries have done to get there. And another interesting thing I want people to understand is, if you take a look at different industrial revolution, and if you see which countries led those revolution, those countries came out and became economic powerhouse immediately after that, right? So first industrial revolution was steam engine and Britain sort of led that, right? And right after that, they became economic power for next many years. Second industrial revolution, I would say was, you know, uh, railways and electricity in early 20th century. And US sort of led that. And then US became the economic powerhouse for next century. And if you take a look at third industrial revolution, that was the entire information age, information revolution. And US along with China, they led that revolution. And today both are superpowers. And if I take a look at what's the next industrial revolution, I think it's around AI and we don't have that much time. This has already started. And we have next one to two decades to sort of either lead that revolution or become part of that one to two member, uh, you know, whichever countries that lead that. And I think if India misses that train, we're gonna be kicking ourselves. We won't have any other excuse. And I wanna end my argument with this last thought. And I sort of borrowed this from the same podcast of uh, Narayan Murthy with Mohandas Pai. I think here he says that in last 300 years, since the time Britishers came to India, this is the first time that world is sort of started to recognize India or respect India. And we have to sort of build on that, right? Right now, demographics are in our favor. We have the youngest population. And if we don't do that, if our youngsters grow old before we get rich, I think we'll have no one to blame but ourselves. So I'm gonna start my final thoughts with a quote from Charlie Munger. Show me the incentive and I'll show you the outcome. And so I think that there's three ways that a 70 hour work week could be implemented, right? Uh, first of all, you could force it, right? You could use the stick. That's the incentive. You could say, hey, you gotta work 70 hours a week. That's the law now. Or maybe companies are you know, incentivized to enforce this in their company work culture. And so it trickles down to employees who don't necessarily get a direct incentive apart from just getting paid for the extra hours that they're working. That's one option. I think that's a terrible option. People, young people will rebel. There will be tension. There will be anger, frustration. People will wanna leave the country in droves, right? You'll have brain drain times 10. Now, the middle option, and this does sound to me like Narayana Murthy's request to young people, it's like there isn't necessarily a stick, but there also isn't really a clear carrot either. It's more of just appealing to people's uh, nationalism, um, their love for their country, their love for their 
you know, family members, their fellow countrymen and women, uh, people, right? It's like, you know, you're doing this for your children. You're doing this for your country's GDP. You're doing this so that India can move ahead in the world, which isn't, you know, that maybe is a vague carrot, you know, floating up in the sky that you're never going to quite be able to grasp because it's not something that directly benefits you. Uh, it's kind of a carrot, but not really, right? So that's the middle route. The carrot route, the clear carrot route is to offer a proper incentive, right? Incentivize people to work harder. Don't force them to, but say, hey, you know, there's this amazing reward if you work 70 hours a week. And I think if you can actually implement that kind of incentive system, and I said this earlier during the China section, but I think that's how you win. That's how you actually achieve this. And I think that's how the GDP will also go up. And so at this point in the video, I just wanna quickly explore a slightly different facet of this topic, which are the speakers, right? The people that we've talked about in this video that are spreading this message of working really hard, right? In India, we've talked about Narayana Murthy, we've talked about Bhavesh Agarwal. In China, we've talked about Jack Ma, we've talked about Xi Jinping, right? In the United States, Henry Ford, right? He wasn't necessarily advocating for overworking, but he's, a leader as well, right? So the thing that all these people have in common is that they are leaders, right? And most of them are entrepreneurs. They're business owners, they're founders, right? And so I think the reason why, and maybe they're misguided in spreading this message, or maybe this is exactly what they plan because obviously they need employees to work at their companies. And so they have a vested interest in people overworking for them. But basically these people, they're ready to overwork and they've seen the results of overworking. And so it makes sense that they would be spreading this message because if they work 70, 80, 90, 100 hours a week, then they see a direct benefit because they're the people who own the machine, right? They're not cogs in the machine. They are the owners and creators of the machine and they reap the most reward from that machine. And so in my opinion, I think that young people watching this video should really think carefully about whether they wanna believe this sort of narrative that these CEOs, these leaders have created to incentivize people to join and become a piece of the machine, right? Uh, I think that's brainwashing, honestly. I think these leaders have a lot of influence, a lot of power, they influence society. That eventually trickles down to your parents, right? Your teachers, um, all of these people who are in these salaried positions, and that's the only life that they've ever known. And so they push you in the same direction and they encourage you to go to school, go to college, uh, get your bachelor's, get your master's, do your engineering, whatever it may be, and go and get a comfortable, a uh, safe job at one of these large companies. And I think that that's the wrong approach, not only for you as an individual, yes, it is lower risk, but it's also much lower reward potential, but also for your country, right? Because you can have an outsized impact on your country's GDP if you actually become an employer instead of an employee. And so if you actually wanna take the spirit of what Narayana Murthy is saying, if you actually want to further your own country's economy, Spend that time that you would have spent going to college, um, applying for a job, you know, with millions of other people, trying to compete for them for these very few opportunities. Uh, all of that effort, all of that energy, all of that money, really, right, that you and your parents are spending to get to that position, you could be, you would actually be better off, in my opinion, spending all of that time, energy, and money pursuing entrepreneurship. And yes, again, it's higher risk, and so there is a large possibility that you're going to fail. But if you're that kind of person, if you actually can take those failures and learn from them and use them to benefit yourself in your next business, like all of the successful entrepreneurs that I've ever looked at, they've all experienced failure in the past. There's nobody who succeeds from day one. Even if they don't talk about those past failures, even if it's not public information, they have failed in the past. They've learned from those failures and they've built on top of them. And so I think personally, anyone can be an entrepreneur. It's just a question of determination and thinking outside of the box, which I think not enough people are doing. And I also, like, I look at those young people in China that are you know, quietly quitting and I'm like, why don't you just go and start your own business? If you're, and I guess in China, you know, your business isn't really your business, right? It's the government of China's business. And so there is, again, a stick there, right? A negative incentive where people feel like, uh, do I really want to start a company that's not really even owned by me and they could just kick me out at any point and, you know, make an example of me the way they did Jack Ma, right? And so I get that. But in India, you don't have that same problem necessarily. Um, and so I think, anyways, my, my final thought is like, if you're going to spend 70 hours a week doing something, do it for yourself, right? Build a business, uh, become an entrepreneur, start up, don't 
work for somebody else. Uh, if they're asking you to work 70 hours a week, reject it, find a different job, go to a different com com uh, company or country, right? That is more employee friendly. If you really wanna be an employee, uh, definitely don't work yourself to the bone. Don't sacrifice your health. Um, you know, don't make yourself miserable for someone else's dream. Uh, the only, the only reason you should be miserable is if you're pursuing your own dreams, I guess is my, my final thought. I agree. I think if that's the takeaway we can take from this debate that you don't necessarily have to be working for someone, right? If you're not getting incentivized in a particular company, you don't have to force yourself, right? You have to have that, uh, compare how much you're getting paid and how much output you're giving. It's more for people who are having their own businesses. I think that's the general attitude we have to build in the country. Like I take example of, you know, uh, Silicon Valley people, their GDP per capita is 30 times, 40 times of India. Still they're putting hundred hours, 120 hours per week, right? Because they have that attitude. They have to build something worthwhile for, you know, other countries and for us. So I think that is what I'm taking away from this debate. I don't want people to get stuck on that number that currently I'm working on third, like 35 hours. If I put 70 hours, it's double, I won't have weekends. So let's not, you know, bring that in a personal lives, but try to make that as a, you know, culture, India as a whole. Yeah. And I think just piggybacking quickly off of what uh, Pankaj said, I think if you look at the top, like if you look at the fortune 500 companies, right, how many of them are American companies and also how many of them are Chinese companies, but specifically American companies, it's like the reason why they are the world's largest GDP, a big part of that has to do with the number of international successful businesses, right? And it's just like in general, for whatever reason, a part of the American DNA is that entrepreneurial way of thinking, right? Of starting something from scratch. Maybe it's how the country began, right? Where they basically came in and killed all the local people and took over, right? Which is a very like bad way of going about things, right? India is a very different country in that regard. Um, but if some of that sort of uh, can-do attitude uh, could be successfully implemented here, um, and there were more Indian businesses that have an international presence and are actually like globally dominant in their categories, beating out Chinese and American companies, then I think that's a great way for the GDP to go up as well. But that only starts when young people decide that they want to get into business instead of getting a government job or becoming, uh, you know, an IT professional working for Infosys or Wipro or TCS, right? So that's the change that I want to see personally in India in the next, uh, not, maybe not decade, but the next century. That's well said. Yeah. So who do you guys think won the debate? Was it me saying that 70 hour uh, work week is not going to put India in the number one or number two spot in terms of GDP or? Or my argument that we do need that hard work attitude to sort of bring India out of this situation that we are right now and put it in number one on, you know, in that top league. Yeah. So thanks so much for watching guys and we'll see you in the next one.